Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamansing. Tonight, how bad could COVID-19 get? Ontario releases its projections. Our public health measures so far have made a significant difference. We'll look at what's happening in your province. We're gonna just uh, pull out all the stops on this one. Canada responds to a new threat from Donald Trump. I see a circle on my screen. As we all stay home, new warnings about those popular Zoom calls. And what can too much isolation do to your brain? We start to, I mean, in a way, deteriorate. We'll show you some tips to avoid that. This is The National. For the first time, a province has released a projection of how many could die from COVID-19. Ontario's modelling data described as stark and sobering. I think it's important that we all are robustly realistic about the scale of the challenge that we face. We know the path of the pandemic in Canada so far. The number of new cases each day on an uneven but unmistakable trend upward. A total now of more than 12,500. Deaths increased by nearly 50 today, surpassing 200. But Ontario's modelling data suggests without action it could get so much worse. Officials stressing that modelling is not an exact science. As Chris Glover explains, the future is still unpredictable and crucially, what happens next is up to us. In the scary new world of COVID-19, this is what constitutes good news. I think we could reduce the death toll in Ontario to somewhere between 3,000 and 15,000. Ontario officials estimate thousands will die from the virus, but the projection without any physical distancing measures would be 100,000 Ontarians dead. These will be shocking figures, but the important thing to stress again is that effective actions have been put in place. For me, this is really affirmation that what we've been doing has been working. Doctors are encouraged, but say don't let your guard down. All the gains that we've made up until now in the last two weeks could be erased in a matter of three or four days if we stop doing what we're doing. Even with what we're doing, the virus could kill as many as 1,600 people in Ontario by month's end. But if physical distancing measures are enhanced and followed, that could be limited to 200 people. The reality is the early chapters of our story have already been written. 67 people in Ontario have died from the virus, a fact that wasn't stark enough to keep some people home. So Ontario's Premier released today's information. There are 1,600 people out there who need us to do everything we can in the next 30 days to help save them. Ontario is the first province to release projected death counts. Still, this epidemiologist was hoping to see an estimate of when the peak would hit. I expected a bit more nuance to be presented, but I gather this was an opportunity to communicate to the public, not necessarily to communicate to, to scientists. Officials hoping the shock of this modeling is enough to keep this scary new world a little less scary. Chris Glover, CBC News, Toronto. Wherever you live in Canada, local officials use models to help them plan. We asked our reporters to look at some of those expectations and preparations from east to west. Here's what they found. I'm Harry Forrestell in Fredericton, where the number of people infected with COVID-19 continued its relentless climb today. Four more cases for a provincial total of 95. Now, New Brunswick has the second largest population in the region, but remarkably no deaths here yet, although health officials say they will be inevitable. Across the border, Nova Scotia leads the region with 207 cases, 14 of those added today. Most of those cases are travel related, but there are growing concerns about community transmission in Nova Scotia. PEI added no new cases today. It has 22 infections. And finally, Newfoundland and Labrador added 12 new cases for a total of 195 and the region's only death from COVID-19. Newfoundland and Labrador says it won't be able to do the modeling that will indicate when the COVID surge will hit. 
The other three provinces here have committed to doing that next week. I'm Alison Northcott in Montreal, the epicenter of the Quebec outbreak. The province leads the country with more than 6,000 confirmed cases. That's in part because of more testing here. But there are more than 400 people in hospital, more than 100 in intensive care, and 61 people have died. Quebec's premier says he'll reveal projections for the outbreak next Tuesday. Uh, we have to give the population the information we have. Uh, but until now, the information was uh, not clear about uh, the number of cases, the number of deaths that uh, we forecast in the next uh, months uh, or even in the next weeks. Legault says the measures in place so far are working, urging people to follow directives around staying home, physical distancing and hand washing. He says hundreds, even thousands of lives depend on it. I'm Bonnie Allen in Regina, and here in Saskatchewan, three people have died from the virus so far. And at the moment, fortunately, just one person is in intensive care. The province is still calculating what to expect, so for now, all we can go on is an internal report from two weeks ago. It predicted a worst-case scenario of hundreds of people in the ICU at one time, and as many as 15,000 people in Saskatchewan dying. But that prediction was made before most restrictions came into effect. Next door, Manitoba's premier says he'll release some information next week, even though he's reluctant to do so. I'm not interested in trying to scare the hell out of everybody in the province just so that some people start to pay attention. COVID-19 cases in the ICU remain low in the West. Alberta is still tweaking its calculations, but we already know it projects 250 people with the virus will be in ICU beds within three weeks, and it will have 1,200 beds ready. Well, for some analysis, we're joined by our medical sciences correspondent, Kelly Crow. And Kelly, what do you think the strategy was behind releasing these projections? Well, I think there were two objectives. I think the first was, frankly, to scare people. The, lang the language being used was that these are stark numbers. It's alarming. We had 24 hours notice that we were going to hear something disturbing. And I think the, the purpose behind that was to get people who might not be taking this seriously to be serious and to, and to actually understand why these uh, physical distancing measures are being put in place and to, and to actually follow through. But at the same time, I think there was also an effort to give some positive feedback to say, look, this is what could happen, but this is what will happen under, or what are projected to happen under the measures that are in place right now. So a way of saying, um, keep doing what you're doing, but what you're doing is hard, but it's actually having some impact. And we keep hearing about the peak and, you know, how important it is to, to try to keep that peak below what hospitals can manage. Do we have any sense of when we're going to see the peak? Well, so there's so many variables at play here, so um, I think the answer is n no. Although, privately, some of the experts are saying that they're beginning to see early signs that we might see a, the curve flattening, but it will be uh, flattening over a long time. We're going to have to keep these physical distancing measures in place for quite a while. Uh, I think that maybe by the end of next week and the week after, we'll start to see whether the the people returning from spring break, whether the, they uh, were, are responsible for an increase in cases, we'll watch and see what's happening with the long-term care outbreaks. So obviously, it's a question everyone's asking, and uh, unfortunately, the answer is we we'll just have to stay tuned and keep watching. Yeah. All right. Kelly, thank you. Thank you. Ontario's modeling reflects how effective physical distancing can be, but some Canadians still aren't listening. Thomas Dagla looks at officials getting tougher on those ignoring the calls to just stay home. This is just the kind of close contact the Ontario government is trying to eliminate by shutting down a slew of construction projects. It's been striking to see the industry still churning while the province grinds to a halt. Mostly. There's still some idiots on the street. You see that they're like hanging out, you know, acting like it's normal. It's weird. If they issue a lockdown, then I definitely comply. So, but yeah, I have a dog, so he needs his exercise too. This is now banned in Toronto parks, standing less than two meters away from someone you don't live with. And there will be a $1,000 fine to pay. You're disappointed too. Uh, in some of your fellow citizens. It's a minority, but it, nonetheless, a significant enough number that we had to bring in a bylaw. Montreal police are already patrolling parks to enforce physical distancing. 
Newly released data from Google Maps suggests parks are only seeing a small 16% drop in visits, while a whopping 44% fewer Canadians are going to the office. From officials, the message remains. Join us in this battle. Please stay home. Well, if you're getting tired of this, well, we will stop saying it when you start practicing it. I'd rather people be sick of, of listening to me than, than sick with COVID-19. Across Quebec, police are stopping cars in more places to ensure it's essential travel. As the weather improves, it will only grow harder to heed the advice to stay in and away from others. Thomas Dagg, to CBC News, Toronto. Facing shortages already, Canadian healthcare workers could soon find it even harder to get critical protective equipment. After U.S. President Donald Trump effectively ordered a major supplier to cut Canada off. Catherine Cullen looks at the fallout. The uh, N95 masks, the, you know, more expensive, more complicated, better. This America First moment started with those masks. Maker 3M was told, keep them in the U.S. Don't share with other countries, including Canada. Not fair, said 3M. It's been a long-standing commitment to the healthcare workers in those countries, and we are the primary supply for them. Clearly concerned, the Prime Minister leveled what some might call a threat. I think of the thousands of nurses, for example, who cross the bridge in uh, Windsor to work in the Detroit medical system every single day. Seeming to imply it would be a real shame if that changed. These are things that Americans rely on. BC pointed out that one of the things Americans rely on is the material for those masks. I would note that uh, raw materials that are involved here also come from Canada. We live in a community that's strongly linked together and we hope that Canada and the United States can find a solution to this. Instead, things may have become more dire. Trump announced he was preparing to stop the export of all protective gear. Of N95 respirators, surgical masks, gloves and other personal protective equipment. We need these items immediately for domestic use. We have to have them. For France and Italy, places hardest hit, Trump said there could be exceptions. Then he was asked about concerns from Canada and 3M. I don't blame them. They can push back yeah. if they want. Tonight, Trump has issued an order under the Defense Production Act aimed at securing all kinds of personal protective equipment and stopping profiteering. But he also explicitly said that nothing should stop U.S. manufacturers from exporting as long as it remains in the U.S. interest. Catherine Cullen, CBC News, Ottawa. And Donald Trump talked about face masks during tonight's update from his coronavirus task force issuing this recommendation. CDC is advising the use of non-medical cloth face covering as an additional voluntary public health measure. This is voluntary. I don't think I'm going to be doing it. To wear a mask or not has been a question for some Canadians since the pandemic arrived here. Cameron McIntosh looks at how things have evolved. Uh, this is how it goes. One by one, Nathan Bezoplanko and his wife are turning out these cloth non-medical masks. So yeah, it's roughly 50 a day. It's small scale. With his leather bag making business shut down, he started making them for a Winnipeg shelter. Now he's getting requests from across the country. For you know, people that are worried about their grandparents or worried about some immunocompromised folks that you know just want to take extra precautions. Up until now, the advice was masks weren't necessary. What if changed? But the U.S. Surgeon General says knowledge of the virus is evolving and recommends voluntary use of cloth non-medical masks to prevent transmission. The effectiveness of the use of non-medical masks hasn't really been well demonstrated. Today, Canada's chief public health officer repeated her long-held position, but also said if people feel better about having a mask... I think that there may not be any harm in wearing it, as the minister said, if one uses it properly. It doesn't, it's not gaping, it's, it's fairly well fitted. What's changed is over the last couple of weeks, we've started to learn that asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic people can also carry the virus and transmit it. Dr. Joe Vipond wrote an editorial supporting masks, but warns of a false sense of security. This is in addition to washing your hands and physical distancing. 
Bezo Planko, meantime, is sowing what he can. Seems like at this point something's better than nothing. Now, all of this is for cloth non-medical masks only. As for medical masks and these, the N95s, the plea is the same. Leave them for health professionals that need them. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. As guidelines change and officials adjust, communities across Canada are finding their own ways to deal with the pandemic. Anita Bath is following those stories for us tonight. Ian, with so many COVID-19 outbreaks at long-term care facilities across the country, many provinces have put in no visitation rules. But today, Quebec is changing its policy so that people can get their elderly loved ones out of care and into their homes. The person can go down to the door and people will help her or him with their uh, belongings. And the family comes to the door and picks up the person so they'll be uh, no contact with the rest of the residents. So this is uh, clear. Uh, people will be able to, by arrangement, will be able to, to go and, and uh, get uh, the family member. This move comes as Nova Scotia's medical health officer advised against taking people out, saying families wouldn't have the ability to provide the necessary level of care if the virus entered into their homes. And four more people have died at the Pinecrest Nursing Home in Bob Cajun. That brings the death toll there to 20. And while that number may already seem high to you, consider this for perspective. Only 65 people lived at the facility to begin with. And two dozen hospital workers at Guelph General have now tested positive for COVID-19. Those infected include nurses, doctors, maintenance staff and housekeepers. All are in self-isolation. Ian. Thanks, Anita. CBC News has a team tracking every confirmed case here in Canada, and we've put together all that data in a special online interactive. You'll also find the answers to some common questions we get all the time. Head to cbc.ca slash coronavirus tracker. From executive boardrooms to virtual classrooms, Zoom video conferencing is helping millions stay connected. But as Zulekanathu explains, a security flaw could leave your next call vulnerable to hijacking. Brown Music's Board of Education. And Dennis yeah. Johnson was defending his doctoral dissertation last week. Students of color were not achieving at the same rate as when this happened. I see a circle on my screen, and then I see another circle, and then um, another shape, and it's like it's a penis. And then I see the letters N I G G E R. We blurred the content, but Johnson's faculty saw the full effect of what's known as Zoom bombing. Malicious users invade a chat group, often with profanity and racial slurs. It's happening in Canada, too. They started shouting racial epithets. They shouted the N-word. Maya Roy says a 250-person town hall she hosted earlier this week for the YWCA was attacked. It's not just a couple of kids uh, messing around with your Zoom call or with your Zoom meeting. They are using hate speech. The FBI told CBC News it's investigating a handful of what it calls video teleconferencing hijackings. But it also said the best way to avoid Zoom bombing is to follow these tips. Add a password to any online meeting. Change settings so only the host can share their screen and don't share a link to meetings on social media. The University of Toronto's renowned tech research group, the Citizen Lab, says Zoom is fine for a virtual beer with friends or a book club. But its latest report also says Zoom's encryption is flawed and the platform should not be used for private meetings like health or legal appointments. If there's uh, a need to discuss uh, confidential or sensitive data over Zoom, I'd recommend potentially looking for, for another way uh, to do that. Zoom told CBC News it's trying to be proactive about fixes and in a blog post apologized for overstating the security properties of its encryption. Zule Kanathu, CBC News, Los Angeles. Today, a grim figure from New York where more people have died from coronavirus than the September 11th attacks. Sunday is D-Day. We need help by Sunday. Up next on The National, how officials there are trying to triage the crisis. Plus, pharmacists have pulled back how much they'll hand out. Why it could triple your costs at the drugstore. And the latest in our COVID-19 how-to guide. Next, can you pet your neighbor's dog? We're back in two.
The number of coronavirus cases continues to skyrocket in the United States, and physical distancing is creating some eerie scenes. This was downtown Los Angeles this morning. School buses parked, highways deserted, but L.A. isn't the hardest hit, not by a long shot. More than 2,900 people have died in New York State, more than the number killed in the 9-11 attack on the World Trade Center. The governor is pleading for supplies. People are going to die in the near term because they walk into a hospital and there's no bed with a ventilator because there's either no bed or no staff or no PPE or no ventilator. That is what is going to happen. And as Susan Ormiston tells us, it's about to get worse. This is bound to happen. Nurses to worried, door. holding pictures of colleagues who've already died. It is clear that the virus doesn't discriminate. No one is safe. Now you can see there's patients everywhere because of this. In the last 24 hours, more deaths from the virus in New York than nearly all last month, and it hasn't peaked yet. This coming Sunday is D-Day because we know that as of Sunday, we start to run out of ventilators. Worrisome for many U.S. hospitals watching those hot spots and getting ready. This was a parking garage? This still is a parking garage. Oh. Mary Washington Gee. Hospital in Fredericksburg, Virginia, has transformed level one parking into an emergency treatment area. We are not allowing visitors upstairs in patient rooms, so we don't need chairs for the visitors. So we've taken all of those out and deployed them out here. These hangers are actually garden hooks for a potted plant. They'll double as intravenous racks. There's oxygen, computers hooked up to hospital records, open air sealed off, and an HVAC system all built in two weeks. This looks surreal, Doctor. It is surreal. The whole, the whole situation is surreal, and we feel that every day. Patients who suspect coronavirus will be assessed here first, treated, and then, if necessary, likely, moved to critical care inside the hospital. Our colleagues in New York and New Orleans have reported double, triple, quadruple their daily volumes in the ER. So this space was built to, in anticipation of that. Virginia is not an epicenter, and it doesn't want to be. It's about in the middle of the U.S. states, according to infections and deaths. But they know the surge is coming, and it's way out there. The projected peak, mid-May. But it's difficult to wait, knowing that something is coming. Just, we don't know exactly what. They do know they won't be spared. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Fredericksburg, Virginia. There is rising anxiety and political squabbling in the UK as well. As Margaret Evans shows us, the government opened a new field hospital there today, amid heavy criticism over its handling of the crisis. Welcome to the new, brave new world. The official opening of the hospital came complete with social distancing and a virtual presence from the man doing the honors, Prince Charles. In this dark time, this place will be a shining light. Work to transform the former exhibition center into a hospital of 500 critical care beds with an eventual capacity of 4,000 began just nine days ago. The British government is eager to showcase the Nightingale after a drubbing in the media here for what critics have called a slow and confused response to the pandemic. Emergency Here's the health secretary. It is our absolute primary aim throughout this whole crisis to keep NHS capacity to deal with people who have the very serious conditions because of coronavirus. But the British Medical Association is worried about how the new hospital will be staffed when numbers really start to peak, with talk of medical students close to graduation being called on. What we call a baptism of fire as doctors in what is for my generation the most difficult work we have ever done, um, unless you've worked in a war zone. Having previously dismissed concerns about a lack of testing for the virus, the government is also now pledging to conduct 100,000 a day by the end of April. The Prime Minister Boris Johnson, isolated with the coronavirus diagnosis, tweeted about it. You'll have seen the big announcement yesterday about 100,000 tests. That's 10 times the number of tests they're currently managing. And with previous targets missed, trust when it comes to the government is in short supply. Not so for the country's healthcare workers, though. A show of gratitude from a country in lockdown, now a weekly ritual.
Margaret Evans, CBC News, London. The Queen has recorded a rare video message that uh, will be broadcast this Sunday. We'll carry it on CBC Television and CBC Network. The CBC News special, The Queen's Message, will be hosted by our chief political correspondent, Rosemary Barton, at 3 p.m. Eastern. Next on The National, our experts answer your COVID questions, including what are the recommendations for kids traveling between houses of separated parents during COVID-19? But first, coronavirus has changed the way we do the simplest things, from grocery shopping to walking the dog. In tonight's COVID-19 how-to guide, Andrew asks, can other people pet your pet? Old Winnie here, an invaluable companion in a quarantine. But is she potentially spreading COVID-19? It is a remote possibility. Uh, for starters, aside from scattered media reports and images like these, there's no scientific evidence that pets can get sick from COVID-19. Also, studies have shown that the virus survives longest on hard, solid surfaces. On softer things like clothes or fur that are more porous, the virus doesn't do as well. But here's the thing to remember. The biggest issue is people. Because whenever people get close to dogs and they both have dogs, everyone gets all tangled up. It might just be best to maintain the physical distancing for your pet as well as yourself. But if someone does pet your pet, I don't think you have to panic. So keep your dog on a short leash, wash your hands after you get home, and in the meantime, we'll be okay, won't we? <laughs> Welcome back. Canada's battle against COVID-19 is at a critical stage. We know many of you continue to have questions and we will continue to answer as many as we can. Tonight we're joined by infectious disease specialist Dr. Srinivas Murthy in Vancouver and Dr. Isaac Bogosh in Toronto. And uh, Dr. Murthy, let me begin with you. This is an interesting and a little bit complicated question. What are the recommendations for kids traveling between houses of separated parents during COVID-19? Yeah, it's a complicated question that actually the Ontario courts just ruled on a couple of days ago. Um, and they currently say that child should remain in the same situation they were in beforehand. However, they did qualify that with some common sense in that if one of the households was um, at more risk than the other, or was there any difference in the households in terms of transmissibility, um, that they would recommend staying with the less transmissible house for obvious reasons. So uh, how would that play out? I mean, again, I know it's complicated, but uh, what's the relatively short answer of, of how to do that safely? Just, just using common sense, basically. So if you had a drop-off spot that was in a public place, change that. Um, if the transport was complicated and used public transport, you'd have to change that as well. But if it's a quick drive from one house to the other, then you can maintain that relationship um, as long as it's reasonably controlled. All right, Dr. Bogosh, next question to you. I have asthma and so does my child. My job is deemed essential. Should I be going to work? I think that's a challenging question because, you know, obviously not all asthma is the same. And truly, if someone is at significant risk of having a, a really bad asthma exacerbation and, uh, you know, someone who might have uh, hospitalizations from this, you know, it, it might be worth discussing with the employer about uh, perhaps changing their role at work because we, we really really obviously need to avoid uh, individuals getting this infection. And of course, we know some people are more prone to more serious outcomes. And asthma may be uh, one of those underlying conditions that may put someone at risk of having a more serious infection. So it might be worth speaking to the employer about switching up the job for at least the time being to uh, really reduce the risk of getting the uh, COVID-19 infection. Dr. Murthy, uh, what do we know about how the virus affects children under a year old? To be truthful, we don't know that much um, in that there hasn't been too many cases reported in hospitals in Canada and across uh, North America. Um, I just looked up, there's been about only three or four deaths in children across the whole United States outbreak. Um, and so we're still learning a lot. Whether that means that children don't have severe disease or whether that means children just uh, don't have as much disease, um, we still need to do a lot of testing to figure that out. We have about 35 seconds, Dr. Bogosh. I know both of you actually have answered this question before, but we still get, uh, keep getting the question, so I'll put it to you. How do you determine whether someone has recovered from COVID-19? It's, uh, it's a bit different uh, in different uh, locations. So some places 
would actually do another test and some places that would actually do two to two tests to make sure uh, a person is negative uh, other places are just saying you know once your symptoms have resolved you should wait for x number of days and that x can be different so some places are saying wait three days some places are saying wait seven days some places are saying wait 14 days so there's a bit of heterogeneity uh, to determine if someone has truly re recovered well, no matter how many times you've answered that question, you still make it interesting. Thanks to both of you for uh, answering all of these questions tonight. Have a great night. Take care. And we continue to put your questions about COVID-19 to our experts. You can send those to us. You can message us directly on Instagram at CBC The National or send us an email at covid at cbc.ca. Just put The National in the subject line. We know that COVID-19 is having a profound impact on every Canadian, on your health, your finances, your well-being. So we've asked people to share in their own words what keeps them up at night. Meet Ryan Kennedy in tonight's Pandemic Diary. Hello there. Uh, this is Ryan Kennedy. I'm of the Fighting Arts Collective and here in Toronto. We're a martial arts school. We've been in the same location for 15 years. We are unfortunately closing our doors uh, to training. I'll show you the training hall. Once it became clear that we are not going to be back together uh, anytime soon, we called our landlords to uh, you know, ask for a break. And they said no. Uh, they wanted to get paid. And they wouldn't even give us one month to um, figure out what to do. This is what we call my office. And I certainly love it here. It's a really sad time, of course. I feel really bad for a lot of my other entrepreneurs out there in similar positions. You know, once the money stops flowing, really, there's not much you can do. You know, I really do feel, you know, kind of helpless. There wasn't really much of a choice. There wasn't options. You know, we just had to, had to do what we had to do. But I know that uh, we're bigger than just some address somewhere and, you know, we will find a way. Costs have become a big issue for those getting their prescriptions filled. And they're finding it more expensive after drugstores started limiting how many meds they'll dole out. Rosa Marcatelli explains the change. Prescriptions are now being filled monthly instead of once every three months. What hasn't changed are the dispensing fees, leaving patients to pay those costs three times more often. Dispensing fees range from about 4 to $15 per prescription, depending on the pharmacy in the province. Seniors can have maybe 10, 15 prescriptions that they get filled at a time. It adds up terribly. It's a bitter pill to swallow for 66-year-old Francois Gouraud, who's on three types of medication. For people that are on fixed income, it's taking the money they need to buy milk and bread and some food and, and whatever. The Canadian Pharmacists Association recommended the change. The association says there are no known drug shortages due to COVID-19, but says Canada does have a fragile supply chain. Asking pharmacists to waive the fee isn't an option, it says. We absolutely recognize that it's a financial burden to patients. Uh, it's a financial burden to pharmacists as well if they start waiving fees. Um, there have been quite a few additional costs that all businesses that are mandated to be essential and open are bearing in terms of protecting their staff. The association asked provincial governments to step up to help minimize the financial impact on patients by subsidizing the dispensing fees, but so far, very few have. It really needs to be a coordinated response. Some pharmacies are making exceptions. Gary Rach says he did get his 90-day supply of medication for a heart condition, but it wasn't easy. I'm a squeaky wheel. I don't accept. I don't take no. So that's just who I am. The Pharmacists Association is encouraging patients to talk to their pharmacists about their needs. It says it's also lobbying governments to provide a reliable and safe home delivery system for medication since some pharmacies either don't or no longer can offer home delivery and seniors shouldn't be leaving their homes. Rosa Marcatelli, CBC News, Calgary. Next on The National, what is being isolated for a long time doing to our brains? If we do that for too long, we start to deteriorate. How it changes your brain, your body, and how to beat it. Next. COVID-19 has forced people around the world to stay home, and everyone's dealing with the isolation in their own way. Familiar faces are sharing their tips. I'm going to make you my favorite cosmopolitan. I want to show you how to wear a scarf. 
Teachers are finding creative ways to reach their students. No, I can't touch my twitchy face. While others are keeping busy by entertaining their neighbors or capturing the moment with a portrait. But being confined to your home can also affect your well-being. Christine Birak looks at the risks and the ways to keep your mind at ease. Many have got the message, but after weeks at home, even yoga instructor Michael Decourt is uneasy. I feel it's more of a stifling feeling. I feel stifled. Professor Lawrence Palinka studies the effects of isolation on groups, from scientists in the high Arctic to astronauts in space. Most people start off energized by the novelty of isolation. Their lowest point hits midway through, and positive feelings return towards the end. But it's not clear when this pandemic will end. Uncertainty is probably the, the biggest contributor to the anxiety that we're facing. Anxiety is part of our body's stress response. To deal with a threat, our brain starts releasing chemicals. To boost our awareness and reflexes, our heart rate and blood pressure also shoot up. Researchers say the body's essentially in survival mode until the threat passes. If we do that for too long, we start to deteriorate. We, we, our body starts to not take care of itself very well. And we can find ourselves at risk for real anxiety and even depression. To avoid that, the brain needs signs that it's okay to relax. And it often gets that reassurance through strong human connections. Handholding doesn't just reduce your, your stress. It actually causes you to feel less pain. For those who are alone in isolation, researchers say the key is being vulnerable. Well, on the well, the vein. That can mean letting people hear you sing watch you dance, no, no. or just expressing your fears. Decourt was worried about teaching yoga from his apartment. I don't want you to see the little space that I live in and stuff, but I think it's that kind of intimacy that keeps us still connected. Once the brain knows you're not alone, it goes back to taking care of the rest of your body. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. For some, the challenges of isolation started well before Canadians were told to stay home and practice physical distancing. David Common spoke to one woman about a trauma that continues to haunt her. Cruise ship quarantines may now seem like an eternity ago, but for those who began the routine of isolation on board, there are some important lessons. We're ready to step out and become normal again. That's when, you know, there was no normal to come back to. Yeah. So we're struggling emotionally. Rose Yerex was on board the Diamond Princess. Close to 50 Canadians on board tested positive, including her husband Greg. And everyone faced at least 15 days quarantine on the ship, plus another 15 in a Japanese health facility. What was all of that like, just being locked down during that time? Crazy making. And, it, you know, in the beginning, maybe not too bad. You know, you shake your head. Oh, my God. Okay, is this happening? But when you get that positive diagnosis, even though we were asymptomatic, uh, it's pretty scary because now it's the unknown. Armed with a clean bill of health letter, they got back to Canada. <laughs> Choosing to self-isolate for another 14 days, even before travelers were told to do so. We live in a small community, and the community had been really, really supportive of us. So we figured it was a small price to pay to self-isolate, just to reassure everybody around us that we're going to be, you know, safe to be around. But when they were finally ready to be around people, all of us were told to keep away. And that hit her and her husband hard. Well, it's basically post-traumatic stress, you know, um, can't sleep at nights, have challenges, have difficulties, have flashbacks, have bad dreams. Uh, we've actually already been to seek some counseling on, you know, surviving trauma like this. When you think about what's happening with other people, yeah, you know, we just take it one day at a time. You've had this experience of six weeks of self-isolation. Mm -hmm. What are the times ahead like? They're going to be challenging. What my husband and I found that helped us was to try and find the humor, you know, try and f look on the bright side of things, think about the positive, uh, don't dwell on the negative because it's not, it's, you know, the only thing you can change in circumstances under which you have no control would be how you respond to it. A challenge to be sure, 
but also a path she's already traveled and learned how to manage. David Common, CBC News, Toronto. Next on The National, finding ways to reach their audience. How COVID-19 has changed late night comedies and how the comedians do business. COVID-19 has shaken up the entertainment industry. Productions have been put on hold, theaters shuttered, but some shows must go on. This Sunday, CBC is launching What Are You At? with Tom Power. What are you looking forward to doing when we're able to get out again? Seeing people. I'm, I think there's, uh, you know, I think in a way it's really given me such an, I mean, such a richer appreciation for my friends and my family and the time that we spend together. You know, you think about That's an exclusive preview of Tom's first guest, Schitt's Creek like co-creator Dan Levy, both at home in self-isolation. Juno Award winner Jesse Reyes will also make an appearance. You can catch the first episode this Sunday on CBC TV and GEM starting at 8 p.m. 8.30 in Newfoundland. Also carrying on those late night talk shows. Many hosts have found a way to keep the comedy going despite the challenges of making TV from home. Eli Glasner has that story. Let's kick it off with some good news. Live from New York and Los Angeles, it's late night alone or at home or sometimes with the kids or a pet. In our self-isolating new normal, network talk shows have abandoned the studio. The Tonight Show's Jimmy Fallon led the charge, recruiting his wife and kids as crew in comic relief. Now late night is a Brady Bunch board of Zoom calls as we peek in on the living rooms of the rich and famous. You want to show the spider too? No, don't scare me, I'm scared of spiders. Where sometimes, just like the rest of us, the tech doesn't quite work. Daniel. I know I can't hear you yet, but I, I sense that you can hear me. Because news. Like many, Because News host Gavin Crawford has gone from having a live audience to doing improv over video. A challenge, but also a way of making sense of what we're going through. Just the absurdities that we're all going through. Or just the fact that like you're like, why is everyone making bread now? And my kid's doing all the important stuff. You're doing great. Hold it. Prompter higher. Sorry. While Crawford is finding the comedy in conference calls, Canadian Alana Harkin is producing Full Frontal with Samantha B. What has been the hardest part for you and your remote team? Looking at myself constantly on Zoom. But there are upsides. It's fun booking people. Everybody's at home. So, like, <laughs> no one can say to us, oh, I can't. I'm traveling that day. <laughs> You're not. <laughs> Pow! And as to whether the homemade style is here to stay. Everyone is going to be so sick of seeing, uh, like, zitty talk show hosts with their kids yeah. running around in the background. People are going to be like, oh, my God, I just, I'm so happy. I just watched Jimmy Kimmel for an hour and there wasn't one kid in it. This is formal Friday in our house. A return to artifice once we put the virus behind us. Eli Glasner, CBC News, Toronto. Next on The National, changing up the business plan in our moment. One of the surprising things we're selling is yeast. Apparently there's a lot of home baking going on everywhere right now. The cafe owners who turn their store inside out to keep things going. Next. Well, for lots of communities in the country, having access to supplies can be a concern. And so one cafe has changed up its business model. The transformation of Herring Cove, Nova Scotia's Pavia Gallery is tonight's moment. We had a lot of infrastructure in place, so we had fridges and freezers and shelves, but they were all not in the cafe space. With a lot of back-breaking work, we sort of moved fridges and freezers from downstairs upstairs, and we put shelves in place. And we're following provincial uh, health guidelines very carefully, so we only have four customers in the space at any given time. We have a bakery, so we have fresh bread and cookies, and we also have a small takeout business. One of the surprising things we're selling is yeast. Apparently there's a lot of home baking going on everywhere right now. Um, and then everything, vinyl gloves, toilet rolls, fresh produce, cheeses, honeys, as much from our local suppliers as we can possibly get. The feedback has been pretty remarkable, actually. I think people are just, I mean, we're, Herring Cove is a small fishing community, so we'd be about 20 minutes outside of the city of Halifax. We're able to provide a very small, very safe space for people. 
So if I have this right, I think they had three coffee shops and technically would have had to close down under the new rules, but because they transformed one into that kind of neighborhood stop and grocery store, they're able to stay open and provide really good service for people in the neighborhood. I'm sure that's happening across the country. That is the National for Friday, April the 3rd. Good night.